Hello, my name is Bill Bowen and I'm a project management instructor here in Ottawa, Canada. Today I would like to talk about how to create a network diagram and the difference between the various network diagramming techniques that you might encounter during your academic or professional practices. I've been teaching network diagramming techniques for a number of years now and I'm sometimes approached by students who have done a little research and found what appears to be a different technique or approach to network diagramming that uses slightly different formulas. They question why this difference exists and if the approach they are being taught is valid or not. So to answer this question, I thought I would create this video that compares and contrasts the two most common approaches to preparing a network diagram. My hope in doing so is that I can illustrate that there really isn't much difference between the different approaches as each approach produces a valid answer, although you need to interpret the interim results from the different approaches slightly differently. So without further delay, let's get started. By now in your studies, I hope you've already encountered a work breakdown structure. This is where we take a project and we break it down into individual tasks. Being able to do this step is critical before you can begin your scheduling. I hope as well that you've also encountered a Gantt chart. A Gantt chart is a visual representation of a schedule that shows the various tasks, predecessors, and durations. In today's video, we're going to take the Gantt chart and turn it into a network diagram. The network diagram shows us considerable more information than is available within the Gantt chart, and many project managers find the network diagram to be very beneficial to a project. Some of the benefits of the network diagram is it highlights which tasks determines the overall duration of the project. These tasks are usually what we consider the ones that are on the critical path. And it shows the earliest start dates that tasks can begin and end. It also shows how long they can be delayed or how much slack is within a task. So it shows when the latest a task could begin without affecting the overall duration of the project. This information is not available in some of our other scheduling techniques and is very useful to the project manager. So let's now look at a very simplistic network diagram. We're just going to take the task precedent information from our Gantt chart and create a very simple network diagram. We'll illustrate each task as a node and connect the nodes using the precedent information as you can see here in this network diagram. This diagram doesn't tell us much more than the Gantt already told us, but it's a start towards creating our network diagram. We can now add duration information onto our simple network diagram, and this is done one of two ways. We can either add the duration information onto the arrows that connect the various nodes, and this is simply called activity on arrow or AOA network diagram. Alternatively, we can show the duration information within the node itself, such as I've shown on the green part of the network diagram. This is called activity on node or AON networking diagramming techniques. As you can see, the information displayed is the same. It's just how you choose to display it. For consistency, I've redrawn the network diagram using only the activity on node technique. By examining our network diagram, we can learn quite a bit of information about the project. For example, there are three parallel paths through a project. Path 1 consists of tasks A, C, and F. Path 2 consists of tasks A, D, and G. And Path 3 consists of tasks B, E, and G. Furthermore, through a visual inspection, we can tell that the duration of Path 2, that's tasks A, D, and G, is the longest at 20 days, and thus forms what we call the critical path. As tasks A, D, and G are now the critical path, it tells us that any delays on either, any of these tasks will delay the overall duration of the project on a one-to-one -one basis. We can also see that some slack exists in the other two paths. For example, on path 3, that's tasks B, E, and G, it has a duration of only 16 days. This means that there is four days of slack existing in this path. Tasks B and E can be delayed for a few days or experience schedule slippages without affecting the overall duration of the project. While this type of visual inspection on simplistic projects such as what I've drawn, those with only a few tasks, works, it does not work for larger projects where hundreds of tasks with dozens of paths through the projects might exist. As such, if we're going to use network diagramming techniques, then we need a more formal approach for how to handle more complicated projects. Rather than just focusing in on one approach to network diagramming, 
This video will compare and contrast two slightly different approaches that you are likely to encounter within your academic or professional career. The first approach is often encountered within academic settings, such as colleges or universities, as it is slightly easier to teach. Authors such as Pinto, Kersner, Larson, and Gray will use this approach within their textbooks, while the second approach is shown within the PMBOK and used within MS Project. Both approaches give valid and consistent results. The primary difference between the approaches is how they deal with the start of the projects. Approach 1, which I will refer to as the academic approach, as it is more frequently taught within colleges and universities, specifies that a project begins on day zero. Intrinsically, this will consist of how we think of for days. For example, when a child is born, they must be in the world 24 hours before we think of them as being one day old. This means that their life began on day zero, not day one. It should also be pointed out that many standards, such as ISO 8601, also specify that things begin on day zero. On a more practical basis, you will see that approach two is a little more simple to use as it requires less adjustment and achieves the same results. The second approach, which I will refer to as the PMBOK approach, specifies that projects begin on day one. This is consistent with our ideas of how a calendar works. For example, January 1st of a new year is thought of as day one, not day zero. This is the network diagram that I will be completing as part of this video tutorial. It uses the same seven tasks that we encountered earlier in the video. I will walk through how to fill out this diagram using both approaches, but first I want to draw your attention to the legend that I put in the bottom right hand corner of the slide. This is the legend that I will be using throughout the video, and I have color coded each entry to make them stand out more. Normally within an academic setting or within a business environment, you would not need a similar color coding system. I just felt that it would help highlight the information in our walkthrough. I would also like to point out that many different ways to represent the information in a network diagram exist. On this page, I've shown you some of the different techniques that are used in the various authors that you might encounter within your academic endeavors. As you can see, there is no real consistency, as each author has chosen to display the same information in a slightly different format. The format of the information is not as important as simply ensuring that you understand what, what information is being presented in each box and how it relates to each other. And that's what we'll be covering as part of this video. In this slide, I have begun setting up the network diagram. I have labeled each of the nodes with the task name, and I've used the same duration information that we encountered earlier to specify the task durations of each task. Notice that the task duration information is represented in the middle of the top row for each of the nodes. I'm going to show both network diagramming approaches, and as such, I have created two separate copies of the network diagram. In the top one, I will show approach number one, and in the bottom one, I will show approach number two. If you remember, approach number one uses a project start date of zero, while approach number two, the bottom diagram, has the projects beginning on day one. As such, I have entered a zero for the estimated start date in tasks A and B of the top diagram. As such, I have entered zero for the estimated start date in tasks A and B of the top diagram. These tasks have no predecessors and thus can be started as soon as the project is started. I have also entered a start date of one for the early start date in tasks A and B of the bottom diagram. And thus, both network diagrams have been initially set up and I am ready to begin our forward pass, which will tell us the earliest date tasks can be started and the earliest finish date they can end. It will also reveal the overall project duration and which tasks are on the critical path. So let's see how that's done. Now that we have the early start date and duration of each task, we need to figure out what the early finish date of for each task. For this, we'll need a formula. To determine the earliest that a task can be completed, we simply add the task duration to the task's earliest start time. You can see this works well with approach number one. The earliest that task A, a six day task, can end is day six. However, for approach number two, a small adjustment is needed. Task A of approach number two still ends on day six, but we need to subtract one day because we began the project on day one instead of day zero. And you can see in our formula, we make a one day adjustment. In this slide, you can see that I've updated both our approach number one and our approach number two network diagrams with the early finish dates for task A and B. To be able to proceed with our forward pass, we need to be able to determine the early start dates for tasks that have predecessors. 
For approach number one, the formula is easy. The early start date for a task is simply equal to the early finish date of the task's predecessor. While this formula is easy to work with, conceptually it's a bit confusing, as you now appear to have tasks beginning and ending on the same day. Approach number two addresses this problem by adding one day to the previous task's early finish date. Logically, this is how we think of tasks beginning and ending. A task is finished at the end of one business day, and a new task begins at the beginning of the next business day. However, we now have a situation where task C's earliest start date in approach number one is different than task C's earliest start date for approach number two. This can cause some students to have some concerns as the two approaches to network diagramming seem to be creating diverging results at this point. But let's carry on and see where it goes. At this point, we have all the tools and formulas that we need to complete the forward pass of both of our network diagrams. We know how to determine the early finish dates for tasks, and we know how to determine the early start dates for tasks with predecessors. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and fill in the rest of these diagram using the formulas that we know. I've completed the forward pass of the network diagram by adding in the early start and early finish dates for the remaining tasks. I've included examples of the calculations in some of the cases. Feel free to pause the video and verify the math if you wish at this point. With our forward pass calculations complete, we now know the earliest the tasks can begin and the earliest the task can end. We also know the critical path of the project and which tasks lie on that critical path. We can see that tasks A, D, and G are part of the critical path. Tasks on the critical path mean that any delays occurring within these tasks will increase the overall duration of the project. Tasks that are not on the critical path, such as B, E, C, and F, have some degree of slack in them, but at this point we don't know how much. We'll find that out on our, on our, as part of our backwards pass. Before we begin the backwards pass for our network diagram, I've presented this diagram which shows the formulas that we've encountered so far. It shows how early finish dates can be determined for a task and how early start dates of successive tasks can be determined. Our backwards pass will allow us to determine the late start late finish, and slack available for each individual task. To begin this process, we first must determine the late finish date for all tasks without successors. These are tasks that, that occur at the end of the project. To determine the late finish date for these tasks, simply take the project's overall duration. That's the maximum early finish date that we determined in the forward pass, and in our case that's 20 days. And Include this as the late finish date for all tasks without successors. In this diagram, I've shown how I've taken the project's overall duration and used it as a basis for beginning our backwards pass by including it as the late finish date on all tasks without successors. Now that our diagrams are set up for the backwards pass, the first calculation that we need to do is determine the late start date for each task. Tasks that are not on the critical path can have their start date delayed a little bit without affecting the overall project duration. The late start date simply tells us the latest that a non-critical path task can be started without delaying or impacting the overall project duration. Similar to our forward pass formulas, the backwards pass formulas differ ever so slightly. A small adjustment is needed for approach number two. In approach number one, the late start is simply equal to a task's late finished minus its duration. For approach number two, a task's late start is equal to a task's late finished minus its duration plus one. I've now added in the late start information for tasks F and G in both approaches of our network diagram. Having found the late start date for tasks F and G, we now have to find the late finish date for tasks C, D, and E. For this, we'll need a new formula. As was the case with our forward pass formulas, our approach one backwards pass formula to determine late finish date is fairly simple. The late finish date for a task is simply equal to its successor's late start date. But once again, we see that approach two requires a minor adjustment to keep the dates aligned. 
we need to subtract one day from its successor's late start date. Again, simply think of this adjustment as necessary to represent a task being completed at the end of a business day and the next task beginning at the start of the next business day. Notice, however, with our backwards pass, the adjustment now means the late finished dates for both approaches are aligned. In this slide, I've returned to our network diagram and I filled in the late finished dates for tasks C, D, and E. At this point in our backwards pass, we now have all the formulas we need to fill in all the late finish dates and the late start dates for the rest of the network diagram, which I've gone ahead and done. And you can now see that the network diagram is essentially complete with the exception which we haven't determined the slack for individual tasks, but we have determined all other information required for both approaches to our network diagram. Before completing the network diagram, let's pause for a moment and review the formulas that we've encountered so far. As I've stated before, the only real difference between the approaches is that approach 2 shows tasks being completed at the end of one business day and the next task beginning at the start of the next business day. Other than that conceptual perspective, the two approaches provide identical results. The last element that we need to complete our network diagram is the slack or float available for each task. Tasks that are not on the critical path can have their start dates delayed or their durations increased without impacting the overall project duration. This is referred to as either the task's available slack or its float. The formulas for determining slack or float for a task is the same regardless of which approach is used. There are many different ways of determining how much delay a non-critical path task can accommodate. I have listed two of the formulas on this slide. They are as follows. Late start minus early start, or late finish minus early finish. Notice no adjustments are needed in slack or float formulas. And with these last formulas, we can now complete our network diagram for both approaches. To recap what we've covered, I've included this slide, which is a summary of all the formulas that we've encountered during this presentation. Hopefully this will aid you in your studies. Now that we know more about network diagrams and their full potential, if you take a look at a commercially available package such as MS Project and the network diagram that it generates, you will see that it is missing much of the forward and backwards pass information that we've included as part of this presentation. As developing a clear, readable network diagram that conveys the information to your audience in a useful, beneficial manner can be a bit of an art form. I feel that being able to produce network diagrams by hand not only aids in your understanding of the technique, but also sometimes is the only way to produce custom diagrams that are in the format you want them to be in. I hope that you found this side-by-side -side comparison of the two networking diagramming techniques to be useful and helpful. I really don't see much difference between the two approach. Both give good results and I understand the conceptual perspective behind both approaches. It is handy knowing that different approaches exist, as you never know which one you'll encounter as part of your academic or professional career. And thus, this concludes the video. I have done several other videos on project management and I encourage you to check out my channel for similar resource type material. So this is Bill Bowen, thank you for listening.